Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining our Google talk today on the history of the free press and the impact that it has on your world with the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Joining us today are Gabe Rotman and Gunita Singh from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. A little background on what the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press is, is an organization that is focused on providing pro bono legal representation, amicus curry support, and other legal resources to protect First Amendment freedoms and the news gathering rights of journalists. Gabe Rotman is the Director of Technology and the Press Freedom Project for the RFCP. And Gunita Singh is the or is a legal fellow at the RFCP. Gabe, Gunita, welcome both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for joining us today. I know I just gave a quick overview of uh, the RFCP and your titles, but would love to hand it over to you guys to, to elaborate on, on both those things. Sure. Thanks so much, Connor. Um, yeah, the Reporters Committee is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary uh, this year, which is very exciting. We were founded in 1970 at a time when journalists were being hit with an unprecedented wave of government subpoenas to reveal their confidential sources, which obviously posed a huge threat to the ability of journalists to safely tell important stories, so many of which rely on that critical reporter source relationship. So as Connor mentioned, for 50 years, we've been offering free legal services to members of the news media, helping to protect their First Amendment rights and their news gathering and freedom of information interests. And we do this through direct litigation, amicus briefs, also known as friend of the court briefs, um, where we write briefs in cases that are likely to have an impact on the ability of the press to gather and report the news. We publish legal resources on our website and also run a hotline staffed seven days a week by reporters committee attorneys to answer a wide spectrum of questions from journalists. Um, I'll note that we take a broad definition of news media. So in addition to helping traditional journalists, we also work a lot with wonderful documentary filmmakers uh, because they of course are in the business of disseminating information to the public and we wanna help them tell those critical stories. Um, Gabe, if there's anything you wanna add uh, about our mission and our work, please feel free. Otherwise I'll, I'll dive into some of our COVID-19 work as of late. Uh, sure, I'll just mention that uh, uh, my, my role at, at the Reporters Committee, I'm an attorney, but uh, I also work uh, on, I work on the, the legal side, but also as far as public policy and public education uh, on how uh, technology impacts press freedom today. Um, and you know that that mainly focuses on things like reporter source confidentiality protections and um, you know some digital security issues. Uh, and so we, um, we we've engaged on those issues uh, over the the last two years with the creation of the Technology and Press Freedom Project. So great. And just to provide a little more context on uh, Google's relationship with the RCFP and a little context for today's conversation. Uh, I've been working with the Google Ad Grants team and the RFCP on a public awareness campaign for the past 10 months called Protect Your Right to Know, which is focused on increasing public awareness about the importance and significance of journalism and a free press in America, as well as the threats that exist that, um, that pose significant threats to the continued existence of both those things. Um, so our conversation today is an extension of that public awareness campaign. We'll be talking about a lot of the similar issues that that campaign was focused on, as well as walking through the uh, specific threats outlined in the 2019 Press Freedom Report released by the RCFP. Uh, as Gunita mentioned, I think a good place to start is the work that the RCFP has been doing around COVID-19 and how COVID-19 has affected journalism and the free press more generally. Yeah, I'll be happy to, to dive into that. Um, one of the many issues that Reporters Committee is, fo is focused on is open government, which basically just means the concept of keeping avenues open for journalists and the public to uh, access information from government bodies. And we have been hyper-focused on this issue lately because one of the many ripple effects of the pandemic has actually been its effect on open government. So we've actually been collecting data since early March, right as folks um, began to quarantine uh, regarding how states and localities are treating public records and open meetings laws in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, 
And we're seeing all kinds of modifications to open government laws. So to take a step back, all 50 states plus DC have laws that guarantee varying degrees of public access to government documents. And roughly two thirds of those laws have been significantly affected over the last five months. And the problem is that journalists rely heavily on public records and public meetings to learn about the activities of government. And particularly on the public records front, Reporters Committee has consistently fought for easier access and enhanced transparency. So as soon as we began to see states modifying their open government laws, we knew we had to do something to help journalists navigate these changes. So I'll, I'll start by sort of summarizing what we've seen. We've seen massive delays um, of records requests and even suspensions of public records laws in 31 states plus DC. So stated a bit differently, 32 in 32 jurisdictions across the country, we're seeing that states have either amended their laws to suspend deadlines for responding to public records requests or state agencies and individual cities within the states have informed requesters that they will either not respond to requests at all or that processing will be delayed. So I'll provide just a couple of examples to show what this looks like. Um, in New Jersey, the state legislature there amended its public records law to suspend all deadlines related to the processing of records requests, um, which means folks are gonna be waiting uh, God knows how long to have their public records requests fulfilled. Uh, in Hawaii, they inexplicably suspended their public records law altogether via a proclamation by the governor, which is for sure the most egregious move we've seen on the public records front during the course of the pandemic. In Delaware, their public records law was modified by the governor, and now the deadlines to respond to requests have been extended by 15 days after the state of emergency ends whenever that will be. So it's virtually an indefinite suspension of the public records law there. And we at the Reporters Committee maintain that this is a huge problem because public records have always been this key way for people to get primary source information on government conduct. So without that, you effectively eliminate this paramount reliable way to hold government accountable. And if you remove that mechanism in a time of crisis like this one, it's all the more concerning. So we've been, um, compiling and, and regularly updating a chart on our website that has up-to-date information on the status of open government across the country right now. And journalists have been consulting it as they navigate the situation. And I think it's been a helpful resource for them because alongside all the negative examples, there are also some positive ones that, you know, I've encouraged journalists to point to when they're dealing with a stubborn or or non-responsive agency to just say, hey, there are plenty of agencies just like yours that are still prioritizing the public's right to know, so y'all should step it up and do the same. Unfortunately, it's worked in some instances, um, but in others, journalists and news organizations have had to push more aggressively, like the New York Times, and, and I'll just end by, by mentioning um, that they, they sued the CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control for COVID data, and, and I'll mention this because they, the Times has really been doing an extraordinary job publishing cumulative counts of uh, coronavirus cases in the US. But last month they, they had to sue the CDC under the FOIA, which is the Federal Freedom of Information Act for data on race, ethnicity and county for folks who've tested positive for the virus. And they weren't able to get everything they needed from the federal government because the federal government doesn't have all of that information, which is a whole other conversation about you know, the fragmented public health system. But basically as a result of their FOIA lawsuit, um, compounded with efforts to collect numbers from state health departments, they've been able to compile a really comprehensive picture of what kind of uh, toll this virus is taking, which is especially important um, if we're trying to understand, you know, the disproportionate effect uh, of all of this on black and brown folks, which has obviously been a huge problem. Um, there's so much more to be said on that, but I'll leave it at there for now. Uh, if y'all have more questions, by all means, we can get into this some more at the end. But, but for now, I'd love to hear Gabe uh, teach us about the First Amendment. Uh, quick, quick question on the COVID-related uh, public records issue. I think it'd be helpful to understand what is typically in those public records that are being delayed. I think this is a, a COVID-19 is an issue that people are obviously engaging with daily in terms of data and analysis around um, what I assume is stuff that's in public records, like case counts, as we mentioned, the demographic uh, 
distribution of cases. Would love to hear to tie this to like our audience's day to day, what the consequence of not having that public records are based off what's typically in those public records. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are all kinds of public records that journal journalists are looking to get right now, like pandemic response plans. If we can get pandemic response plans from various state agencies, then the public is allowed the opportunity to examine whether you know my state is in fact complying with those pandemic response plans. I am able to figure out and analyze whether my government is doing everything it's in its power to, to protect me, um, whether it's adhering to those plans that they've laid out. Um, I've spoken a lot with education reporters who are trying to understand the impact of remote learning on, on students. And they're trying to get data on how many students don't have access to laptops right now. So whether it's you know the big picture, how the government is responding to the pandemic at a high level, or if it's individual families who are trying to make the best decisions for their kids in, in this unprecedented, unprecedented time, there's a wide spectrum of public records that folks are trying to get their hands on. Yeah, super helpful. And, and for further context, where does the RCFP typically plug in there? Are you helping in the instances that you uh, mentioned with states delaying their required response time and when they need to respond to requests for public records? Where does the RCFP plug in there? So uh, oftentimes individual journalists will call into our hotline, which I mentioned earlier. And if they have questions about public records, I will be the person on the other end of the phone. And sometimes they'll say, hey, I got a response from an agency where they said, we don't know when we're gonna be able to get to your public records request. So in that kind of case, you know, I'll point them to our chart and I'll say, hey, sometimes the best route is to use your powers of persuasion as a journalist and, and pressure them into giving you information because these public records laws are just that, they're laws. You know, they're not suggestions, they're not nice ideas, they're laws. And it's the same with the federal FOIA, um, the Freedom of Information Act at the federal level, Congress has not amended FOIA. And that is the, the only way for FOIA to be modified if Congress amends it. So if journalists are submitting federal FOIA requests and they're saying, hey, you know, they haven't complied with the statutory deadline under FOIA, we're able to help them craft administrative appeals to kind of put some pressure on the agencies to, to comply with those statutory deadlines. Okay, and obviously you mentioned with the case of uh, the New York Times and the CDC, the CDC was not providing some of that data or, or the reason they said they were providing some of that data is because this is simply obviously an ongoing crisis and they don't have a lot of, or they don't have complete data on the issues that the New York Times was requesting and that was part of their justification behind the delay, um, I believe. Um, I would, it would be helpful to understand what, what this normally looks like outside of an ongoing massive crisis like this if we see governments or institutions often push back these deadlines, or if this is really unique either because of the quick evolving nature of this crisis or for another reason, if the pushback of um, public records request is unique or something that, that often happens and we just are, are less aware of it because we're not all paying attention as much as we are now. That's a really good question. I, I wish I could say that outside the context of the pandemic, FOIA ran smoothly 100% of the time, but it doesn't. Um, these agencies, especially the big ones like the State Department and the Department of Justice, oftentimes have really significant backlogs. And that poses a huge problem for the public's right to know. Um, sometimes these FOIA departments at these agencies aren't given the resources that we think uh, they, they need in order to be processing these, these records requests in a timely fashion. And as a result, journalists who are trying to do valuable public interest reporting have to wait eons in order to get the data that they need. Um, but the statutory deadline under FOIA is the agency has 20 business days to provide a determination about whether they're going to release certain records, withhold certain records, what's the ratio if they're gonna do a little bit of both. And um, like I said, it doesn't always work that smoothly, even outside the context of the pandemic. But thankfully, the Reporters Committee um, has a ton of resources online, like the FOIA wiki that our wonderful staff attorney, Adam Marshall, uh, created. And it has a wealth of information with the ins and outs of the Freedom of Information Act. Um, so journalists and ordinary members of the public who, who want some assi assistance navigating FOIA should absolutely turn to those resources.
Yeah, that's great. And it's super helpful to understand both the role that journalists play in getting this information out to the public and some of the challenges that they always face, as we're saying, but but um, particularly right now face. Um, and obviously, as mentioned, this is a, a topic and an issue that most of our audience is probably staying on top of and, and keeping a pulse of day in and day out. So I think understanding both the role journalists play as well as the RCFP is, is a great place to start here. As you mentioned, Gabe, would love to hear from you on, on a framing the, what, what the freedom of the press actually means here, because I know we're going to use that term a lot today, and it's freedom of speech and freedom of the press are thrown around a lot in a colloquial sense, but it's obviously different than the constitutional definition. Um, so I'd love to, to hear you speak a bit about that before we jump in. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, happy to do so. So I'll try and just do, uh, you know, pre uh, uh, just a basic historical overview of, you know, what the First Amendment is, what it says, um, you know what it means and uh, what and the protections that it confers to the press and to the public generally now um, because it's it has mean meant different things over over time um, so the first amendment is the first amendment to the US Constitution uh, and it was um, it was ratified in the late um, 18th century uh, after a debate over, whether it was whether it was important to have enumerated rights in the Constitution, um, or whether if you were to enumerate those rights, uh, it would potentially restrict rights because anything that wasn't listed there, um, the government could argue, you know, it, it isn't a right that's conferred in the Constitution. Um, there was a lengthy debate. Uh, Madison, uh, who was initially against the Bill of Rights, then became um, kind of the biggest supporter, and uh, he uh, was one of the main architects behind the First Amendment. Um, there's actually very little uh, sort of contemporaneous uh, uh, information on, on what exactly the, the uh, you know, that first Congress was thinking when it ratified the First Amendment. Um, but there's two concepts that uh, are, are pretty important to understanding why it's there and, and what it is there to prevent and protect. Um, one is uh, something called seditious libel, um, which is kind of what it sounds like. And it's basically uh, laws, enforceable laws that uh, allow the punishment of uh, seditious expressions, criticizing the government. Um, and simultaneous with that, there's also this concept in First Amendment law of a prior restraint on speech. And the distinction there is a prior restraint means you stop the speech before it happens, you know, usually with a court saying, um, I'm going to issue a court order that says, if you say this, I'm going to punish you, um, you know, or, or, some, or worse, something else. Um, and then there's also post post uh, publication punishment. So, so it, there's uh, uh, there are restrictions on the ability of the government to punish speech after you've said it if it's somehow uh, wrongful. Uh, but generally speaking, the First Amendment was concerned. The the First Amendment, when it was ratified, was uh, greatly concerned with the notion of a prior restraint because um, even if the speech is sanctionable after it's been said, the greatest threat to um, the the free flow of information and public debate, uh, particularly over political issues, is stopping speech before it's before it's it, it can be said. So, so that's the the historical background. Um, the First Amendment itself uh, it has kind of two parts. There are the religion clauses, um, which we're not going to talk about today, but those basically pr protect the the free expression, the the free exercise of religion, and uh, they bar the establishment of um, of religion by the government. Um, but putting those aside, the four uh, protections that are expressed in the First Amendment, and the First Amendment is phrased in a very particular way. It says, "Congress shall make no law abridging four things: freedom of the sp freedom of speech, freedom of the press." Um, freedom to petition the government for uh, the redress of grievances and the freedom to peaceably assemble. Um, what's crucial to understand there is the First Amendment could have been written to say um, the the rights to th those rights shall not be abridged. Period. Right? Or every person shall have those rights. 
Um, but it's phrased Congress shall not abridge because, and this is a key concept, is there has to be state action. Um, the First Amendment isn't just a blanket uh, protection for, for everything. It is a prohibition on the government taking steps uh, to interfere with certain with, with those certain rights. Um, and again, you'll notice that it is Congress shall not abridge, the, so the US Congress, uh, but through a legal process called incorporation, um, the rights that apply to the federal government um, have been held to apply to the state governments as well, state and local governments as well. Uh, and so right now, the First Amendment uh, applies to any state action restricting those four rights. Um, and then uh, just one, one last little piece of co color here. One key thing to understand too is that the, the First Amendment as it exists now is kind of only 100 years old. Um, in, uh, for for uh, a large chunk of American history, there really wasn't a lot of case law where you, you were going to the Supreme Court, I mean, there's, there's literally none, going to the Supreme Court, challenging a law saying it violates the First Amendment. That really didn't happen until starting in uh, World War I. Uh, there, there was, and this is going to come up again in the conversation, um, Congress passed something called the Espionage Act of 1917, um, shortly after the US entered World War I. And that started the modern, um, the modern course of First Amendment law. Um, and you know, just to, and this is drastically oversimplified, but you know, basically the First Amendment says um, that uh, that the government can't restrict speech um, except in two contexts. One where there are these historically unprotected categories of speech, things like fighting words, right? So if I say something that's going to make you punch me in the face that is not constitutionally protected or incitement to, to lawless action. Um, that is also not constitutionally protected, but the court, the Supreme Court has limited the scope of what incitement is over time um, to be relatively narrow. So right now, incitement is if I say something that is uh, likely to cause an imminent uh, lawless act, then that's not protected. Uh, and then there's another category, um, and I won't get into that too much, but basically it, it boils down to if the government has a really, 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 really good reason um, and uh, the law is written in a relatively narrow way, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, courts will allow restrictions on what's called content-based speech. So if you're going after speech based upon the content, and then there are other restrictions that are content neutral, um, uh, and those apply to things like protests and, um, and, and public assembly. But the so bottom line, state action and prior restraints are uh, really the big thing that the First Amendment exists to protect against. Yeah, great. Yeah, I know that might seem basic, but I think it's always worth clarifying that freedom of the speech is freedom from intervention by the state, not necessarily intangible threats that might exist that might make it harder for the free press to function that don't strictly fall under uh, a, a threat to the First Amendment, which is primarily what the RCIP is focused on and what the uh, the Freedom Tracker report outlines. Um, continuing down that thread, I think now with an example with COVID of, the, of, of where journalism and the free press fits into our day to day, a clarification on what exactly freedom of the press is, I think it's helpful to just take a step back and discuss why it's important at all, why it's crucial to have a free press in a country like America and what the consequences in its absence um, are, particularly since the, not every country has an amendment or a constitution like ours that guarantees and protects it. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to, to take a stab at that. Um, it's it's something I think about ad nauseum, as I'm sure Gabe does too. Um, there are innumerable reasons why a free press and open government matter. Uh, and I'd like to, to start by bringing it back to our earlier discussion about the role of the press during the pandemic. Because the biggest reason why states have said that they will refuse to process requests for public records is that they deem it a non-essential service at this time when resources are strained and government employees are working from home they basically consider it unnecessary. And one example that highlights this perspective uh, is from my home state of California, where the city of Burbank has been responding to requests for records by saying, 
the city has determined um, that responding to your records request within the statutory timeframe is not an essential service. And this is ludicrous because the public's need for timely, reliable information about our government is at its apex right now, um, and generally in times of anxiety and uncertainty and crisis. Uh, I'll note that in Hungary right now, the government has enacted radical anti-transparency measures during the course of the pandemic, classifying information about investments, and, and some critics have expressed concern that they're using the pandemic as an excuse to become more secretive and less open, and ultimately less accountable to their citizens. And that's just one of you know tons of examples of why facilitating accountability through transparency, while always important, is, is especially important during times of uh, pervasive fear and uncertainty. So when I see journalists who are struggling to get data about race and COVID, for example, it doesn't just anger me at this lofty theoretical level. It's something, uh, you know, I think about how New Orleans Public Radio repeatedly requested data from Louisiana officials about coronavirus cases broken down by demographics. And it wasn't until they published a story about the issue that the state finally began sharing that data. So what I'm left wondering, and I know tons of other people are left wondering, is would having access to information about the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on the Black community a week or even days earlier have been able to save lives? So these are the questions that the government needs to reflect upon before they cut off access to information that communities need, both in general and, and to navigate this particular crisis. And it's questions like that that motivate the Reporters Committee in our fight to facilitate open, you know, reliable access to government records and other information that helps us uphold transparency and, and foster accountability. Yeah, I think that's a, a great example with the obviously super recent CDC New York Times example and um, I think bringing it to like the individual level in the absence of understanding who's or what portions parts of our society are most affected by COVID. It's hard to have discussions about how our government should respond to the crisis, particularly when we're determining uh, relief spending and stimulus bills, who should uh, or where that money should be going and, and where relief is needed. So really just as like an immediate very clear example of the absence of that data makes it a lot harder to have those conversations uh, in a way that maps to reality. Um, and of course, journalists or journalists and the free press have uh, often proven to be a check on power and a check on the state um, in a number of different ways. Watergate obviously comes to mind as, as a famous example. Um, to either of you, any other examples of just like where the press has, has played a significant role in, in keeping the government accountable or pushing forward a, a national dialogue that in its absence, would it have occurred potentially? Uh, yeah, I, I can I can take that one. So so absolutely absolutely, and this also goes to the the core uh, purpose behind uh, the First Amendment and, and particularly the press clause. You know, there uh, there's a case from the 1960s called New York Times v. Sullivan which basically said that, uh, you know, in the case arose during the civil rights uh, era, uh, and the case basically said that if you're a public figure and you're suing somebody for defamation, um, you need to make sure that uh, the, the person really wanted to defame you, um, that the person knew or acted recklessly with regard to whether what they, they said was true. And the whole point behind that case and that holding was um, robust public dialogue about uh, public affairs is crucial to ensuring that the electorate is informed, which in turn, you know, leads to both the protection of individual liberty and a check against government, um, a check against government activities, uh, you know, but it also leads to better public policy. Um, the more that the, the 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 more free we all are to um, uh, to disagree with one another over uh, you know the minutia of tax policy or uh, you know the weightiest uh, questions about public affairs and national security, uh, you know the theory is the better our public policy will end up being. Um, you know, and so historically, you do see that uh, Watergate is is a great example of where reporting, you know, revealed serious government misconduct. 
uh, you know, the Pentagon Papers case, which also kind of arose during that, that um, arose at that time, you know, that was a uh, top secret study of the reasons and the reasons why the US government got into the, the Vietnam War and also the reasons that it presented to the public about why it got into the Vietnam War. And that was also, uh, it ended up with, uh, 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 what is now a cinematic story uh, about the press interacting with um, with the government. But not only has it happened over history, um, and, and incidentally, by the way, press freedom also, you know, it, it, it's also not just not just government, you're also talking about cases about public health, you're talking about cases, you know, related to things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, just m more recently, we've seen uh, a significant number of stories come out after 9-11, um, so the rendition, detention, and interrogation program at the CIA, uh, co uh, commonly known as the torture program, that was the result of um, uh, of, of government leaks. Uh, the war warrantless surveillance story that came out in 2005, also a result of leaks. So, you know, generally the free flow of information about government activities, you know, to the press results in a, uh, results again, theoretically, but in practice, in um, a more informed public debate, which hopefully leads to better public policy. Yeah, I think um, that's a good transition probably to some of the, the threats that are outlined in the report. I know we were going to talk about some of the intangible threats first, but I think jumping right in on, on leak prosecution and then the changes, or given how significant leaks in the government and, and information coming out of the government has been in the past to making the public aware about certain issues or crises. Um, I think that's a, an interesting one to jump in on. Just to frame this a little more before I hand it back over to you, Gabe, um, the Press Freedom Report, which is a report you guys release every year, and you guys can expand upon this, uh, that outlines some of the primary threats to the First Amendment uh, and to journalists more generally. These again are the threats that fall underneath the, the strict interpretation of the First Amendment, more so than some of the intangible threats that that might just exist um, generally in society, but are not necessarily state actions. Leak prosecutions and a crackdown on uh, leaking, specifically in the national intelligence community, has been a trend in the past two administrations that has been a uh, unique and recent, and has had some immediate changes in terms of how. The national intelligence community interacts with the press. So we'd love to hand it over to you to hear a bit about that specific um, threat and how that's evolved over time, given that it's a, a relatively new one. Sure. Uh, so, so just going back a bit, you know, again, so I mentioned the Espionage Act of 1917, um, which is kind of a recurring character in the modern history of the First Amendment. Uh, and, you know, that law, uh, if you read it in isolation and you read it literally um, right now, uh, it applies to anyone who receives what's called national defense information. And for our purposes, let's imagine that it's classified information, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, but that, that law potentially makes it a crime to receive and disclose government secrets, even if you haven't sworn an oath uh, to the government. Um, and you know, even if the disclosure of the of that information is in the public interest, um, and so you know, again, colloquially, uh, it covers leaks. Government, you know, imagine the Pentagon Papers, but you know, these things happen. These things happen every day. Um, you know, oftentimes they're uh, they're strategic uh, in order. They're strate strategic disclosures in order to inform public policy, win a debate. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, grind axes, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different, you know, reasons why the information leaks. But one thing that is clear is that, you know, it, it is, it is a crucially, it, it is a, a crucially important dynamic, you know, particularly when you're talking about something like national security reporting, where um, the classification system is widely seen as, uh, as widely seen as erring on the side of overclassification. So, you know, even the um, the Solicitor General who argued the Pentagon Papers case for the government in the 1970s had an op-ed in the in the 1980s after the Reagan administration uh, uh, made a number of moves to go after leaks, basically saying that a lot of information that's classified doesn't need to be classified. That the disclosure of that information wouldn't cause legitimate national security harm. Um, 
Um, and so historically, there's generally been um, what some have called a disorderly situation um, where the government had has uh, wide authority to try and keep secrets. And then the press was seen as having significant discretion to report on those secrets. Uh, and a, for a, a while, it worked relatively well. So for instance, in World War II, um, there was government censorship, but it was widely, it was, it was heavily voluntary. So there was an agreement, um, you know, between the press and the government where if the government said, this is really problematic, you can't release it, and the press said, okay, then, it, you know, again, it worked relatively well. So for instance, um, the existence of the Manhattan Project was known to the press before uh, the end of the war, but they didn't, they didn't report it. Um, that's sort of for, and, and, and so while there were a couple of instances where uh, the Department of Justice and, and government prosecutors contemplated seriously prosecuting not just uh, government, uh, not just journalistic sources, but the press itself, every time that happened, uh, the, it, the, the government would walk back uh, and either they would decide not to prosecute or in the closest they ever came, the grand jury refused to return an indictment. But bottom line, until about 10 years ago, there was really only one case that involved the, the, dis the public disclosure of government secrets through the press um, where someone, where that, uh, that person was prosecuted as akin to a spy under the Espionage Act. Um, in, in fact, that case was so unusual that that person, uh, Samuel Laurie Morrison, was pardoned by uh, President Clinton because his case was so anomalous. Um, fast forward to 2009, starting under the starting with investigations under the Bush administration, and then cases brought under the Obama administration and continuing into the Trump administration. Um, if you've got one successful prosecution in, in the 80s, you've got uh, 20 uh, attempted uh, prosecutions in just the last decade, um, including some that we would all know, like um, like Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning, um, and uh, in many of the and reality winner. In many of those cases, uh, the government has been successful in in prosecuting you know that that individual, um, and it raises a whole bunch of you know different different issues, but. Uh, I could ramble on for hours on this stuff, but uh, you know the one thing you mentioned sort of intangible concerns, and you know the 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 intangible concern that you can see in in the modern history of leak prosecutions is that sort of forbearance, that understanding where the government we're going to keep secrets as as closely held as we can, but if you find them out, you can report them if you think they're in the public interest, um, and then on the the press's side where if you make an argument. Um, to us, and uh, uh, that it's compelling that the release of this would cause real harm. We're not going to report it, which happens. And so, one of the intangible concerns is, you know, has that understanding broken down somewhat? Um, you know, or do are, are either sides feeling empowered in ways that they weren't before? And that's concerning. Yeah, and I think. Um beyond that intangible concern. Another thing that was outlined in the report in relation to league prosecutions is uh, like the chilling effect of just the interaction between the national or the national intelligence community and journalists. So even when there are, even when there are not issues that are strictly classified, there's just a lot more trepidation and caution in regards to interacting with journalists and journalists reporting on that sort of stuff because there's such an increased crackdown on it. Um, that that's obviously another potential consequence of just this this being a, yeah. a recent yeah. update. Absolutely, I mean the, the chilling effect on uh, that dissuade sources from coming forward, even when they're talking about something that isn't classified. Um, you know, the fact that they're concerned about it, uh, it, it is a direct impact on news gathering and impairs the free flow of information to the public. It's it's absolutely a concern. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want us to jump to questions soon, but I want to make sure we outline some more of the threats that are outlined in the report. Uh, Gudita, I know we were going to speak about search and seizure and arrest of journalists, which I know is probably something that is not super physical or visible to uh, everyday consumers of news, but is, is nonetheless like a very, very strict um, threat to the First Amendment. And I think it's worth shedding some light on here. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about one incident in particular that was um, referenced in the in the 2019 report, and it involves a Bay Area journalist named Brian Carmody. Um, last year, uh, Carmody obtained a police report from a confidential source. Um, he had sold the police report to a local news station, which then reported a story about it. The San Francisco police actually questioned Carmody about who his confidential source was and Carmody refused to give up his source. But a few weeks later, the SFPD actually took a sledgehammer to his door, uh, very aggressively executed search warrants to search his home and his office. They seized his notes, devices, and his journalistic work product um, while, while he was handcuffed for six hours. So this is obviously troubling, not only because California's constitution protects journalists and their work by protecting the identity of their sources, um, but it's extremely troubling that they went to such lengths to violate his rights just to secure the identity of his source. But even worse, two FBI agents were also there at the raid to question him. And so that raised our eyebrows at the Reporters Committee because um, there are exacting standards that federal law enforcement has to meet in order to even question a member of the news media when that questioning relates to their news gathering activities. So I'll briefly mention that the Reporters Committee actually filed a FOIA request to the DOJ and a couple of its subcomponents to try to figure out whether the FBI actually complied with the law that requires them to obtain express attorney general approval to question Carmody. Um, the, the agencies didn't provide us with responses within the statutory time frame, so we sued them. And we're actually in the middle of um, litigation. We're in the middle of briefing that case right now. And we're arguing that the government hasn't conducted adequate searches for records. Um, but we, we suspect as of now that the, that the FBI didn't comply with those regulations before questioning Carmody, which is very troubling because, you know, you mentioned the chilling effect earlier, and this is exactly the kind of behavior from law enforcement that has a profound chilling effect on journalists. And, and that chilling effect has to be taken seriously. It's why we have these laws to protect journalists and the integrity of their work in the first place. Um, and I'd love to let Gabe weigh in unless, if you, if you uh, have some additional thoughts on this. No, uh, uh, no, thanks, Katina. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, no, the Carmody case is, uh, you know, is definitely, you know, is definitely of concern. And, you know, there's also a couple of cases that have come up recently, um, you know, also in the league context. There is one case um, in uh, one of the Trump administration league cases where um, the a journalist had uh, her, her records, um, you know, seized uh, in an effort to identify sources um, in, and seized with delayed notice. So the, uh, the reporter didn't find out that the records had been um, disclosed to the government until a after disclosure, which, uh, you know, raises a number of concerns for reporter source confidentiality. But, you know, again, these these types of things they go kind of what I, to what I I was I was getting at, which is you know, law is great and the First Amendment is great, um, but if people don't internalize uh, you know those those restraints, then um, you know then we're going to spend a lot of time in the courtroom. But in the interim, you know, these types of things can happen, and you know that's that's harmful. Yeah, definitely, and I think that. Obviously, we're, that final point there about law being great, but it, it still requires, like, I guess, democratic norms to be applied to to actually like continually um, behave underneath the principles of the First Amendment, and and uh, for those norms to be perpetuated. And often, as we're saying, they, they change over time, and and there are consequences to that. Uh, tying this back to the the PSA campaign that the RCFP and Google were running together. Uh, which was focused on on making people more aware of journalism and the importance of the free press uh, and their and the significance of them caring about it. I want to ask one question related to recent events that I think ties a lot of the stuff that we're discussing together, and then we can shift to some of the audience questions. Um, that question is about uh, the the protests that we've seen over the last couple of months. We've obviously spoken about COVID um, and and the implications that 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 has to journalism. And the other massive societal event over the last couple of months have been the protest and reaction to the death of George Floyd. Though the protest in the, the reporter outlined is like a, an area where there's a lot of threat to journalists. 
but I want to talk about the intangible um, consequences here, threats here. And I think a question that some people in our audience might have, which is particularly in this case, and we've seen more and more over the past two decades, societal movements and protest and political change have been brought about by individuals documenting injustice or abuse of power on their smartphones and distributing it through social media channels. And that's how attention has been brought to a lot of these consequential movements. Um, as we're discussing here, that is typically what journalists and the press see themselves doing as well, is, is bringing attention and light to issues and abuses of power. Um, what I want to hear from you guys on is what is the role of a journalist in, in the digital world where everyone is essentially a reporter? And specifically, what is it that journalists do and, and bring to the table that um, citizens documenting injustice and distributing through their channels uh, might not be able to do? What's that gap that we need to uh, be aware of as, as we see more and more activism and, and attention being brought at the individual level? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, it's interesting, uh, Congressman John Lewis had recalled that in the civil rights era of the 1960s, that police often, often attacked journalists first. He said, um, if you had a pencil and a pad and if you had cameras, you know, they would take the cameras and smash the cameras. But it's interesting because now everyone has cameras in their phones. Um, and I think it's really interesting that the first source of information today from the scene of a newsworthy event um, is often an average person with a smartphone, as you mentioned. But, but these folks really do play a significant role in monitoring government, particularly when they serve as a source for the news media who can then distribute the information more broadly. Um, I'll note that there's a study that was done of eight popular news sites, which showed that the sites collectively used over 200 items of user-generated video per day, with the New York Times using on average 20 pieces per day. So I think that interplay um, that ordinary citizens and members of the news media have with each other is actually something that can really elevate important news stories and, and ultimately elevate important conversations, like the conversations we're having right now about police misconduct and police brutality, which is actually why the Reporters Committee writes amicus briefs or friend of the court briefs in cases that have to do with whether there's a First Amendment right to film police officers during the performance of their official duties. Um, last year, we actually wrote such a brief in a case where a non-journalist was trying to film on-duty police officers, and we took the position that the right to film officers is protected by the First Amendment, and that was important for us to do in part because of that dialectical relationship where the press and the public very much work together to tell um, important stories. But, but that said, the press are, are still often singled out as targets, not just by police, but by other forces as well. And all of that is, is uh, discussed at length in our 2019 Press Freedom Report. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that's perfect in terms of the value that democratize, or the John Lewis quote, I think is really uh, enlightening in terms of everyone has a camera, everyone's a reporter, so it's a lot harder to, to crack down and like, um, hide bad action by the state or institutions of power um but at the same time there's there's a there are there are things that journalists do and, and the press do that individuals of course can't do so they they have a complementary function of course individuals are probably not going to be suing the cdc in the way the new york times did and getting us access to that pub, those public records um but at the same time it was just the new york times you wouldn't have the documentation of of uh, injustice in the way that we do with everyone having, having access to a, a medium. Um, so very interesting change to, to uh, the press and, and how we bring about social issues. Um, Want to jump to questions to make sure we, we cover the questions for our audience. We have a question here about the Freedom of Information Act. I think this is actually more of a question for Gabe about the First Amendment and anonymous free speech. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, the 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 lawyer the lawyerly answer is that it's complicated. Um, the, uh, um, the 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 but the short answer is yes, it is. Uh, so anonymous speech is protected 
um, in the same way I sort of gave the, the, the schema of how the First Amendment works now, where you have certain uh, categories of speech that are um, you know, historically unprotected um, under the First Amendment. Uh, and then there are, uh, and then if you're trying to uh, restrict in some way uh, or punish speech based upon its content, um, that, uh, that's allowed in, in only very, very limited circumstances. There's only a couple of uh, Supreme Court cases that have uh, upheld um, restrictions under that. And when you're talking about anonymous speech, um, and, and restrictions on it. Uh, basically, what it comes down to um, is anonymous speech that could otherwise potentially be um, be reached under the law uh, would would is protected if there's a a, a credible fear of retaliation um, for engaging in that speech, and that's related to kind of the history actually of anonymous speech in the United States during the the founding era and the American Revolution. Um, it was it, it was uh, par for the course that uh, you know prominent thinkers would uh, speak anonymously because they would be under threat of um, in some cases physical attack. So you know the authors of the Federalist Papers, for instance, uh, published them anonymously, um, and so that history kind of informs it. Um, but but it's you you can think about it in a lot of the same ways that if the, sp the underlying speech itself is you know is protected. Um, the fact that it's anonymous um, doesn't really uh, get into it. There, it gets a little complicated when you're talking about disclosure around, um, uh, you know, for instance, things related to campaigns. But generally speaking, yes, anonymous speech is protected. Great, and I think we have another question here about lockdowns. Do governments even have staff available to honor records requests? Yeah, so um, I'll mention at the federal level, the most analogous situation, and it's really not a perfect analogy, but the most analogous situation we have is government shutdowns. So during government shutdowns, we have seen federal agencies suspend processing of FOIA requests. A common trend that we would see during shutdowns is agency uh, agencies saying they'll resume FOIA operations when their funding is restored. But, but during the pandemic, government employees are still working. It just looks a bit different, right? A lot of them are working remotely. Um, and some agencies at the federal level, a federal level are, are still processing FOIA requests. Um, but st the State Department and the FBI actually both entirely suspended their FOIA operations for, for a period of several months. And now they've both reinstated their FOIA operations and they're beginning to start processing FOIA requests again. But yeah, the employees are there. And I very much think it's possible to balance you know, the need to physically distance and stay safe with the public's right to know, which, um, which is ex extremely important. And, and like I said, several agencies have been able to strike that balance. And I hope that more agencies uh, continue to, to, to strike that balance. Great. Um, and then those are the questions we have, but with the time remaining, I guess, just to, to put a cap on this and uh, tie up some of the, the issues we've been talking about, I think it'd be great to hear um, your thoughts on, on why it's important for people to care about journalism and the First Amendment and the free press. That was what a lot of the focus of, of our PSA campaign was together. So I think tying it together and just getting your thoughts on what role individuals and citizens play here in terms of being more aware of why this is important um, and potentially what they could do to help. Um, would love to just hear your thoughts on that to wrap up. Gabe, you want to take the lead? Uh, so I, I'll, I'll go very high level. Um, you know, here, I, the you know, the, there's the phrase the fourth estate. Uh, you know, in uh, to refer to the press, right? And there's some. It, it's used in different ways, but uh, you know, it, and it, uh, um, it, it the etymology of the term is is uh, you know in France dealing with the other estates like. Um, you know, like the church, but when you use it in in the U.S., it generally uh, the connotation is that you know it's the fourth, it's the the kind of the fourth branch of of government alongside, um, or it's like it's like a fourth branch of government alongside the courts, the legislature, and the executive. Um, and when you use it in that way, effectively, what you're saying is 
the courts check Congress and the executive, you know, the executive checks uh, the courts and and Congress and so on and so forth. And you 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 by decentralizing and breaking up power among competing um, elements of of government, you know, you're both improving governance and protecting individual liberties. And so when you talk about the press as a check on all of those um, by by effectively communicating the promise that um, the electorate will be watching you, and if you do something that uh, if you do something that requires a political response, we will facilitate that political response by by ensuring the electorate is informed. And so, you know, from a very high level, the press acts as a check on government and as uh, 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 something that preserves you know, our, our basic democratic system of government. I'll, I'll try to complement your high level answer in, in the two minutes we have left with a more granular level answer. Um, I'll just start by saying my consumption of news has vastly gone up in the last few months. And I think it's the same for my friends and family. So I think that right there is all the proof you need to kind of recognize how much we depend on timely, um, reliable information in general, but especially in times of, of crisis. Uh, I look at the journalists who are fighting to get records of police misconduct and discipline, and they're doing their part to analyze data, spot trends, do valuable public interest reporting on police culture and conduct. And we can use that to eventually spur reform and reconceptualize policing. And that's just one example of the value of a free press. So when access to public records is denied, I firmly believe that everyone loses. Everyone loses. And, and the last thing I'll say is personally, I'm a proponent of taking historical figures with a grain of salt, but I do love the Thomas Jefferson quote that information is the currency of a democracy because I think it's extremely true. And the journalists and reporters who help us access and sort through and absorb that information, they play an invaluable role in, in helping to move us forward as a people and, and as a society. And I think the reporters committee, you know, part of what we're doing is bridging that gap between those values espoused in our constitution and, and the way we actualize them and honor them each day. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that's a great way to wrap up. Appreciate both you, Gabe and Gunita joining today and uh, and walking us through this topic. Encourage everyone who's listened today to actually walk through the Press Freedom Report, which is on RCFP's website. Uh, we only touched on a, a few of the threats outlined in that report. It's very good to dive into and then also just check out what the RCFP does more generally. Uh, but thank you both for joining us today and having this conversation. Thank you so much.